Welcome back. When we went to break, Jat hit us with his third stat. The question was, in 2018, across a whole bunch of regions, yeah. uh, this champion was 1-17. in 17. That's a 5.6% win rate. We've been struggling this one, so we decided to uh, ask for a little help this time around. So we are going to phone a friend. So here we go. Hello. Freak? Hello. Dash, hi. Yes. Hi. Put it on speaker. Hello? Put huh? the, can you hear me? Put the banana on speaker. Hello, Freak? Oh, I'm going to put on speaker. speaker. Hold on one second. Oh. Oh, for, right. oh, yeah, speaker, good idea. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I got Zyreen um, here with me. All right, you're on speaker. You can, oh, Zyreen, hey, Zyreen, yeah, hey, what's, what's going, going on? on? Freak, uh, yeah. I've got Mark yeah. here. Mark, okay. Hello. And We're Jack? struggling with the question. We're okay, struggling with a little question. What's the question? Hey, I know you guys love champ selects. You're probably yeah. big on the champ select stats. Mm -hmm. Across all of the different regions, what champion is 1 in 17? 1 in 17. 5.6% win rate. Okay. We got 10, 15 seconds. Yeah, like so roughly 15. I actually Let's know go. this one, so I'm going to let him speak yeah, on it. Yeah, so I knew, I knew the first two ones. Why couldn't you phone me them? Uh, but <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking either Cassiopeia or Kled, because mm. I feel like they're not that common, but Ooh. I'm kind of thinking, like, you know, only 16 picks Club overall. Cassio could be. I'm going go to go with Cassiopeia. Yeah, it's on one Cassio game. Freak, Freak, how do you know? Uh, uh, that would be I the didn't only know win. it for sure at 117, but I saw one in 14. Oh, like, I saw a discussion oh, on Twitter. Assuming. So right. then tell us. What is it? All right, it's Mike Young's first champion. Shivana. Shivana. Freak is a phone a friend. Guys, oh, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. There you go. I love you, Freak. 100% right. got... by the way in chat stats now. Hey, yeah. I'm taking you out hang up. Don't, don't I'm taking you out speaker. Just want to wish you guys a great, uh, you know, a great cast today. Thank and, you. Uh, and we'll catch you later. Thanks for your help. Oh, yeah. Bye-bye, right. guys. Bye. Yep. Man. Wow. All right. So, Shivana. Yeah, now we're getting a bunch Only of Shivana Only one win. That win is Let's in the go. LCK. <laughs> Just a bunch of Also, well, she is great at jumping away from a losing fight. I'll give her that. Well, I was going to oh, say, why do, why do you think it is that that champion is 1 in 17? Uh, that, I mean, that's even been played that much if the win rate is that bad. There's definitely some bad luck. Uh, yep. The champion was super dominant in solo queue, but you can't do anything when you're behind. Gotcha. Uh, and also, very early on, it's not that great of a fallback pattern. Like, someone catches you in the jungle, they just kill you. People have, I think, definitely slowed down in their picking of that champion. Oh, oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. All right, that's enough with the numbers. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum and make some statements off of gut feeling alone. In some specialty. overreactions, <laughs> Mark is really great at these. So, first up, I'll re-explain the segment. I throw out a statement, and you guys tell me whether or not it's a blatant overreaction yeah. or not. So we're going to kick this one off with a fun one. CLG, following their win yesterday, are back, baby. Overreaction. Bla blatant overreaction. CLG is not back at <laughs> all. <laughs> there you go. Do not believe in CLG. It, it, and honestly, like it wasn't that good of a win against Echo Fox. Yes, Echo Fox was undefeated. Uh, who he had very questionable early laning abilities. Rainover didn't do much other than maintain Drake's. The only promising thing would be Stixay and Biofrost not falling behind in laning phase. But that's because Adrian was teleporting top lane. That lane was gifted to them. So still a lot of work for COD. To do. Yeah, they took an early game comp, kind of snowballed with it, then fell behind and threw, and then the other team threw back in a uh, Elder Drake. Overreaction. So, so yeah. a, bit, a bit of an overreaction on that one. Yes, All right, moving right along. C9's bot lane has been getting a lot of praise recently, uh, you know, in the wake of the Team Liquid discussion and the best in the West discussion for the new TSM bot lane. I'm going to go ahead and make the definitive statement, though, that the C9 bot lane is overrated. In other words, they are not definitively the best to, uh, bot lane in the West. I Ooh. will agree. I do think that universally stating them as the best team or bot lane right now is an overstatement. They haven't played Team Liquid's bot lane. Team Liquid has great team synergy, so obviously that kind of amps up the bot lane. But Double is yeah. playing with some ridiculous, like 16 KDA right now. And while Sneaky and Smoothie do play a very different style, they're much more team focused, I have a hard time giving them overall the best bot lane. I, mm, it's not a crazy statement, but it would be an overreaction to say definitively. Right. Okay. If you That's are think... saying that they're the best in the league, you can say that right now. I think yeah, you can yeah, argue yeah. it. It's a defendable leave. point. It's a very defendable point, but okay. to say that it's not even a discussion after this long, no. But they're they're playing great. All right, here's another fun one. Poe Belter is the new NA faker. <laughs> faker has lost five in a row. Faker has lost five in a row. So by that, by all accounts, then high is the new yeah. NA Faker. So Paul Belter has been playing <laughs> great, especially his game yesterday. He has, I believe, the highest uh, CS per minute, as well as all uh, NA mid laners, all players in North America. He's been crushing, but uh, Faker is in a league of his own, and I think Paul Belter is just now entering that conversation of uh, competing with the best mids in NA. Okay. Yeah. He's always been top tier, obviously, but he's never been definitively the best. Right now is when he's probably making one of his best 
best cases he's ever made. But once again, to be faker means it's unquestionable. Yeah. Interestingly overreaction. enough. Overreaction. Okay, overreaction, slight overreaction. I be, I be, whenever you compare anyone to faker, yeah. it's an overreaction. Probably. I feel. Now, yesterday, Febivin and Power of Evil actually chimed in with their own power rankings on the NALCS Lounge. Let's take a look. All right, so if I, had, if I had to put you guys on the spot to make a, a mid lane tier list for me, obviously you put yourselves at number one because you're the greatest, but who's, who's after you then? Who would be the, the, your next three? Who would you put in the top besides yourselves? Probably, I think Pobot is the best. Okay. Uh, after that, I think Jensen. And uh, yeah, probably Bjergsen after. But it's it's really hard to say because I've played players. For example, I haven't played against Power of Evil like mm -hmm. at all. You know, in scrims. Yeah, we didn't face each other. So before. it's like it's really hard. So I'm just rating the players I face. Yeah, you know? yeah. So what's your top three? I feel like I would probably say literally the same, but I would add. So I would say Pobelta, Jensen, uh, Bjergsen. Uh, but I would say. I'm not sure, but I feel like Phoenix did quite good as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm Actually, not sure how I would rate guy. him. Like, I feel like he deserved to kind of be like the third as well, like maybe with Bjergsen right now. Phoenix is Azir. Come on. He's winning on other champions. He had a great Rise <laughs> game, had a great Casio game. He's more than just an Azir one trick, guys. Even right. they were forever the Phoenix Apologists. I mean, to, yeah. be, to be honest, he has been playing very well, but yeah. that's an interesting list and not, yeah. you know, from a, from from very strong fellow mid laners. Yeah, I mean, and that's one of the things that Paul Belthor's come into this year with is that kind of chip on his shoulder to show that he can be the best. And you can see within the pro community of the other mid laners, he's got that respect. Now it's just a matter of getting the community to catch up to that level and also to maintain the level of performance he's shown so far. Four minutes ahead of game time. Let's go ahead and take a look at your predictions for the day. And if I recall correctly, oh. Ooh, there's Zen no Mark. interesting discussions Liquid. to be had here. The both of you aligned today. So no matter Very what, blue. no matter how right or how wrong you guys are, you will Great. remain tied at the end of today at 16 and 9 for your season totals. I want to see more dissension. Uh, sorry, but I think the only point that was really close between us was probably the TSM 100 Thieves game. Yeah, okay. And, uh, I still think this one's really, really close, but TSM has been looking a lot better and should have won that Echo Fox game, who is, what is arguably the best team in the league. So I think they are very strongly trending up. Yeah, and I think that's a super close game. Like, the way 100 Thieves has won their games has been through very close games, and TSM hasn't necessarily blown people out. So it's going to be... A, a big test for them to see if they can kind of keep up with Aphromoo shot calling. I was really back and forth on that one. And I was really back and forth on CLG winning as well. Were you? Because I, no, I, he's just, he's I just, doubt them a uh -huh. lot yeah, well, and don't. their ability right. to win. Uh, but but it, it does feel like a, a day where the majority of the matches, to some degree, feel lopsided, right? Where there is a an little. expected winner for a fair amount of them. We called out game two as being one that feels a little bit more like a coin mm -hmm. toss. Some people might point to game four, mm -hmm. Clutch Gaming versus C9 as being competitive, but the way C9 looks, it still would probably be favored towards them. Yeah, they're absolutely smashing all their competition. They had a lead versus Echo Fox, but we know Echo Fox is really good, so they bounce back. But other than that, it feels like they kind of blow people up. It does match up pretty interestingly in terms of young, native NA top laners, strong import mid laners, and then good bot lanes. So it is a very similar matchup, yeah, but yeah, it, yeah. it does yeah. feel like just C9 is generally better across the board. And we're five games in, going on six. I think Mark and I now have a little bit more to work off of, so I think that's why we accidentally came to a consensus. First day out of six that we've had exactly mm -hmm. the same predictions. I wouldn't be surprised if you guys are having secret meetings. I've only been above 60% uh, win rate like one day. Time for so. some win <laughs> conditions. Let's reframe or refocus here on game one. Echo Fox versus Optic Gaming. Chat, you were late to work today, so I'm going to give you the tough <laughs> task good of defending Optic, but before you go, Mark laid out for me. How does Echo Fox come away with the victory here? Holo, holo, holo. You go with Huni in the top lane. <laughs> he is going to be the focus a little bit, and I think it's a focus in a weird way because he's played a lot of GP against some very confident opponents and has fallen behind. Here against Zig, he has not shown the ability to punish any pick even with counter pick, so give Huni whatever he wants. If he wants counter pick to smash Zig, fine. If he wants scaling to take it late, great, and then focus more on your bot lane. Chat, what's the go-to in the playbook against Holo, Holo, Holo? It's tank top <laughs> and carry jungle, right? And, and, it's, and we talked to Zabotune right at the beginning of NALCS Countdown, and he did say, well, the only game we did win was when Acadian was on a carry, but I also think a core part of that was having Zig on a tank where he could lose lane gracefully. He gotcha. hasn't shown his ability to get counter pick and win. That's not going to happen against Tooney, so you neutralize that as much as possible and try and turn it into a team fighting game. All right, all eyes are on that mismatch in the top lane, but we've got Echo Fox looking to recover from their first loss yesterday up against Optic Gaming. Time now to throw it out to the casters to get us in the games. Enjoy.
Thank you very much. Dash, welcome to the Battle Arena. As you can see, we are 55 seconds away from Champion Select beginning here. Echo Fox did suffer a loss yesterday, but they are still a tied for first team. Optic, though, only one game outside of last at some point. Do need to start picking up wins for themselves. Optic did have a couple of good weeks, though. They, they went from uh, you know, a lot of long games they couldn't win to a long game they finally could win, but then uh, once again kind of collided back down a bit yesterday. Yeah, they keep talking about how they were like one skill shot, one ability away from winning a game or having it, you know, turn around in their favor. And that only goes so far because you really need to have those wins in the win category because we, they were talking about it on the desk. Four-way tie for first and then a four-way tie for fifth. And this is the team that's right below that, sitting at that ninth place right now. Yeah. And if they're able to pick up a win here today, they'll at least be able to tie for that middle of the pack. Yeah, there's a ton of teams at two and three right now. So there's a lot of room to make up right now. Uh, I mean, playoff position right now is actually at two and three. They are right behind that mark. Of course, still lots of games to be played as Champions Select is ready to go on this one. And we will begin anew as Ezreal is the first fan of the game here from Echo Fox's side. Nice little Pobelzer sign showing up in front of the camera. Let's see what happens. Interesting that you would ban Ezreal here on 8.2 because there were nerfs towards him and Kleptomancy, but this is Arrow. Arrow, he has had honestly a phenomenal split so far in his five games that he's played. <laughs> Look at Zig's face in the new new ban. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or just in general. The, Shout out Zig. I'm sorry for distracting you, but it's Zig's fault. Anyway. <laughs> oh, the Fox crew. Let's go. <laughs> Is Rick Fox? Is yeah. it no. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, I love that. I but do. The focus on the Arrow and Acadian in the band so far from Echo Fox. They banned away the Nunu that Acadian played yesterday, and they banned away two champions that Arrow has been showing that he can team fight on. Absolutely the case here. So let's see as the first picks come through, and a lot of mid laners still available actually. Only Azir and Zoe off the table. Rise tends to be a pretty common first pick for some of these squads. A, a lot of junglers up outside the Nunu as well, so. Galio, Galio, yeah. There's a lot of things that are up right now, and they focus the AD carry. You really want to get Callista off that character right here. So Callista in for Altex should work pretty well for him. And it is actually a uh, sort of a defensive AD carry in terms of elimination has been out of position a fair bit so far this split, and it made me feel like Callista would be a very good pick for Arrow just to drag him back out when he does occasionally miss step. But I mean, he played it yesterday, and he had a really good game on that did. Callista. Almost carried that whole thing, but wasn't able to for Optic. So Optic able to trade the Callista for a rise on PoE in the mid lane. Nothing too fancy for him in this one. But a Kog'Maw comes through, so still plenty of high damage output available for Arrow. Of course, no Nunu to buff him up like there was last time around. If you watch the pregame shows that we talked about, it's not about just having PoE and Arrow carry us. They're trying to play a style that will work in the long run that everyone can practice and get better at. They don't want to hedge themselves into one way of playing the game, but, but this is going to be a lot about PoE and Arrow. Exactly. It's a lot about that still. So hyper carry for them. The Cassiopeia counter pick Ooh. here into the Rise. So Phoenix has played this already once into Rise when we were seeing Malzahar be the common counter. He was still busting this champion out. Mm -hmm. I do like Cassio quite a bit. So a fun champion there. And now one final pick in the first phase for Echo Fox. They've grabbed the mid lane and their bot lane farm roll. Let's see what they want to go for themselves. Lots, again, still available. Zero supports have been banned away, so they can get the cream of the crop, and instead they would rather jump in for yet another jungler. Dardock putting a lot of games on Zack so far this split, actually. This is going to be his fourth Zack in six games. One Gragas, one Sejuani rounding out his champion select, so high prize there getting a hard engaged jungler. All tanks, all engaged champions, yeah. though. So Dardock has been a large part of how Echo Fox stylistically like to start their fights, and he's been key, having two player of the games for them, I believe, in their mm -hmm. four wins. So he has more than anybody else on the team, and a lot of that is because he's been making those clean engages happen. And we know Echo Fox has that skirmish, forward-pushing style. Absolutely, they do. So we'll see if the tower does work well for Dardock yet again in this game. The Kench gets unbenched. OS Frog and Twitch chat everybody as Tom Kench does come through for elimination. And I really do like that. Honestly, uh, I know we played some games together with Irene. Yeah. Tom Kench, you feel invincible when you're playing AD Care alongside Tom Kench. Like, I never experienced a good Tom Kench. Still haven't, by the way, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you ate a minion when you're trying to save me. I remember that one. Oh, Ole oh, like, did that too! I know. <laughs> so uh, everyone can make mistakes. But yeah, I mean, it really is so nice. You can play super up front on the Kog'Maw. He can go battle the Caspia, get stunned. Lemon just saves him. It's fine. So yep. it'll, it'll let Arrow kind of continue to play hyper-aggressive. And that's like what happened on his Ezreal game. In the very first game of the split, he was playing in the front line, landing a lot of Mystic Shots, getting a lot of damage up, but he could do this on Kog'Maw too. Yeah, and I'm 
Wondering what the support ban will, or the last ban will be here, but also the Shen, probably a support ban towards Echo Fox, because Adrian, he's had that champion pool that goes all over the place, whether it's the Janna coming out, or if he's going to be playing one of those melee supports, the Taric is still available, and that's the one I would kind of gravitate towards here. Uh, but the Braum is still also up, which could be good for this Callista lane and trying to have more engage, which we know Echo Fox would really like to have. Yeah, interestingly, even though we've seen Adrian play one game on 8.2, he actually went for Thresh in his uh, first professional game on 8.2. So even though the champion pool has been loosened somewhat for competitive bottom lane right now, he is still playing, generally speaking, frontliners. I do like this Kha'Zix coming back in for Akkadian, though. The team is still a bit light on tanks. We assume Zig's going to grab a Maokai or Orn for himself since they're available, but uh, Assassin's for Akkadian, a champion he got to win with. And I really like the fact that they are saving their last pick for Zig in the top lane so that he'll see what he's playing up against, against Huni, mm -hmm. who had some crushing performances in week one, but then in week two, he pretty much got camped. It was just dives on his GP constantly, and he hasn't been able to kind of have that you know, stellar performance that we've been he's been known for. Yeah. So in this game, he's gonna blind pick, and we'll see what Zig has up against him. And I really like the blind Nar because the common counter pick to this champion, it actually ends up being Jace pretty frequently, and Jace, I think, would be really terrible for the comp because there's no great frontliner for Optic if he does that. You've got a, a support Tom Kent, your only durable champion up there, so. Echo Fox going to wait around and see what they want to play for themselves as they've got one engaged tank, a sometimes engaged tank in Huni, and now Braum can also hold the front line as well. So damage up, but very much going to be put onto Phoenix and Altec, but they should be up for the task. Yeah, Braum versus Tarek was kind of the decision there for Adrian. Uh, the Tarek would help with the Zac jumping in, giving him the immunity, which they've used for team fights previously. Uh, but the Braum is more for you know, protection and also having just doubling down on that engage and getting thrown in, being able to peel for all tech and yep. there's the tank that we were talking about so yeah like you said wouldn't fit the comp if he, was, if he were to play jace here into the gnar and i do think maokai works pretty well especially when you've got a kha'zix jungle you've got not only split damage types that ninja tabby can't shut down one merc won't shut down the other but also it's it's hard engage on a squishy champion alongside a kha'zix if optic wanted they could camp Huni. it would probably work pretty well a kha'zix should also have a, a healthier and faster early clear than zack so we might see a Kaden get out to the races a bit earlier than dardock and affect one of these lanes. Yeah, and both of the solo lanes for Optic have really good gank assist, the roots, the point and click, yeah. both of them. This is, when you're playing Kha'Zix, this is pretty much where you want to be, is on that top side of the map, taking control of it. Even though your mid and your top are actually losing lanes in their matchup, you still have opportunity for the enemy to push up past the halfway point of the lane, and they make for easy ganks with a point and click gank assist. Absolutely the case here. So we'll see which comp can play it better. Echo Fox, of course, have had a much better season so far at four and one. Optic at one and four, but a lot of these games could have been winnable with a couple of better choices. We'll see if we still can count out Optic short, or they can continue the week of upsets and follow in CLG step with this one. Crowd cheering, ready to go for this game. It's going to be an exciting one as we start off the day as Echo Fox will battle Optic Gaming on Summoner's Rift. And so far, we're looking at those win conditions from the analyst desk. We have a tank top, and we have a carry jungler for Optic, so Jack set him up with a win condition. I'd love to hear how this game goes and what he thought afterwards. But Echo Fox, there's that gnar for Huni in the top one. Shout out the Rick Fox chance, by the way, in the crowd. Also, the, the giant bubble that's coming out. But we got the green side of the audience, too, for the Optic Squad. Let's see who can make it happen as we are into the game. The first game of the day to close out week three of the North American LCS. Echo Fox 4 and 1, Optic 1 and 4. But the comps look good for what Optic needs. We'll see if they can start their rise to the standings today. And immediately right out the gate, I love looking at who has Minion Dematerializer here. I understand it on the rise for Power of Evil. There's some fun things you can do where it'll help you wave clear a little bit earlier. You can also get burst combos off because if you E a minion and dematerializer it, it'll send, but just like the E when the, uh, the champion or the character dies, it'll spread it to everything. So you can actually do really cool combos that people don't expect where you kill a full health minion with dematerializer and spread it to a champion that's nearby. But then the Braum for Adrian, that's the one that sticks out to me, is that's not really going to help him later in the game. That's more for trying to get lane priority, shove in, kill cannon minions, and get better back timers. Yep. So we'll see if the pushes can be good for Echo Fox here as a result of that rune choice. I really do like how Materializer has materialized in the pro scene and done some interesting things. Drodak and Acadian see each other. Trinket Ward comes down and... Should help track what's going on here. The camp spawning in 15 seconds, and looks like Dardock is still going to make his way down to the bottom side if he wants to and get a leash from his duo. Red buff start for Zach and blue buff start for Kha'Zix, which is not a big surprise. Pretty sure we expect we need to have the push lead top side up against Zig. In fact, getting some extra damage early on is positive for him. Yeah. The fleet footwork as well for the Gnar. Just pushing him out. 
that's actually a bit atypical because Airy is much more common usually. So it's going to be a lot more sustained for Huni in, in ways to cut away from stuff. Grabs his Zardok and goes back up to next camp. Yeah, Huni actually runs a decent amount of sustain on the top laners. Uh, his Lucian as well, he ran overheal and ran, rushed Vamp Scepter. Uh, and on this, uh, I'm curious to see if he has overheal as well on this champion because this helps him just stay in lane and kind of have that poke battle, but it, it's less of, you know, I need Aerie to increase my poke value, but it's more I need to sustain here. So this won't really help him later in the game, but it's more for the laning phase. I wonder though, in the later parts of the game, how much it'll help him. I mean, it's a decent amount of healing, it's a decent amount of move speed. Like, theoretically, mm -hmm. I can see Fleet being a good teamfight tool for Anar just to get in range of, like, that proper ultimate. That's the thing as well, is uh, people always forget about that extra burst of movement speed. It's one of the things, like, we talk about Sejuani jungle using Fleet footwork that helps her out so much in terms of you hit somebody and then your W is pretty much confirmed because you can just chase them down, you'll get the slow. Mm -hmm. And for Nar, getting that first auto will allow you to get that second one and maybe you can throw a boomerang at that point to get your slow and keep chasing. So mm -hmm. it could be something that helps you get that three stack up. We got a gank now in the mid lane as Acadian wants to make himself known right here where Dardoch is still clearing camps, but doesn't have an easy way in on Phoenix looks like now that Cassiopeia is too safe. We saw it a second ago. I want to point out that uh, Dardoch did something really clever, which is, of course, uh, once you get up to this top side of the jungle, you cue the Gromp in towards the blue buff. You kill them both at the same time. Looks like the blue actually reset, though, so we... Uh, I don't know if that was a mistake or if that's actually really common for Zac, but uh, the blue did re-aggro and, and go back to full HP, so we've got to do this from the slow way. But normally you can... I'm pretty sure you can just kill both camps at the same yes, time. Yeah. Uh, and it's a nice time save for Zac. Yeah, it helps him out a lot. Things like doing your red buff and then queuing over to hit the, the Krugs because the Q was changed to have, uh, if you're hitting the single target, you just get you know one blob. If you hit two targets, you get two blobs, which then every blob you pick up reduces the cooldown of your W. Mm -hmm. So it substantially increases your clear time if you're able to hit two things with your Q. Yep. And of course, with there, we saw Huni get eyes on to Akkadian down there in the jungle, killing the Krug. So uh, top lane jungler known. And of course, they can camp. Yeah, the fact that he killed four camps up until that point, you know which ones he got rid of as well. And now Dardoch just had his first back. They spotted Akkadian on the top side. The tracker's knife has come through for Dardoch, so I assume he'll clear his Krugs out. And then if his Raptor camp is up by that time, he'd go that route. But they really want to spot Akkadian one more time before they start getting those deeper wards from that tracker's knife and placing him down. He can definitely be threatened a little bit. Rank two of the uh, Elastic Slingshot gets Dardoch pretty far, and Cosmic without hard CC can't interrupt that. So should get away if he's caught unawares, but still. Don't want to lose a bunch of health for no reason. Bot lane shove is happening for Echo Fox. We've seen two materializers used so far by Adrian down here. As the camp goes away, level four on both these champions. Only one used for PoE, who has a bit of a freeze going here. He has some extra caster minions, so yeah. Phoenix is just going to try to equalize the wave and push, mm -hmm. thin it out a bit. And Phoenix doing the very common thing as well on this precision secondary, going. Um, Presence of mind for infinite mana, so we can spam any time between these camps. Yeah. Every time he levels up, he can spend like 300 mana, get it all back, and continue on. Yeah, she's very mana hungry on the Cassiopeia. Yeah. One of the big things that kind of pushed her towards tier a whole bunch and made it so like the build was up in the air for a bit. But something that you, we have to remember on this patch is the E draws minion aggro now, right? If you start the champion, yeah. It was a change on 8.2, and Rise does the same with his targeted E. So it's not the same, you know, corrupting potion, walk up level one, spam E on somebody. Yep. A bit of a fight down here on this side of the map, but blocked out pretty easily by Adrian, not really feeling any worse for the wear. Does look like Altec will have overall more farm. I would probably expect that for a Callista lane. He should be, yeah, getting above his opponent here on this one, but finally the lane actually pushes back in Optic's favor for a few seconds. Guardian triggers and actually a partial freeze. It'll, it'll force Optic to remain overextended if they want to fight for this wave. But this is the cannon wave, so it's usually when you want to reap. I'm going to going to go back for uh, Reaker Vo plus probably a pickaxe, I'd assume. Should be about 1900 gold, maybe a bit less than that. Might just be dagger plus, because he's only got 1300 gold. Oh I yeah, I, I misjudged it. Sorry. Okay, so he's gonna do a pickaxe dagger instead of like recurve bow boots or something. Uh, interesting uh, back there from him. So Lemonation's gonna have to hold the wave, take some damage. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out the audience, support will come back. Good damage across the two of them. Oh, but the cannon minion, no. Yeah, all that came back. All right, fair enough. Yeah, so Altec, uh, yeah, he's going to push in the next wave. Dematerializer, of course, helps get rid of a cannon wave himself. And yeah, he's actually going to stay entirely. I guess he can wait for one more wave, but now it's going to be a weird desync where Altec just uh, has worse items than Arrow, which should mean Optic can kind of dictate the pace of the duo lane now. Well, he'll have uh, worse items than Arrow until he backs. 
So if he gets a right. back off here, he'll have better items, and then it's kind of that ebb and flow. His Lemonation is actually going back now, so it would be a 2v1 under turret. Okay, a flash out from Pew. We didn't want to get stunned up by Dardock. Trades blows back and forth, and out to go here. 500 gold lead overall for Echo Fox as a squad. Looks like it's plus 10 for Hooney in the top lane, plus 13 in the bottom lane for Altec and Adrian. Some of that, of course, the fact that a recall already came through for Arrow, but still, uh, moderate farm lead for now. Certainly something that's meaningful as Zig is getting pushed under turret. He's already used his first recall to get back to base. Looks like Hooney has not had to do the same thing as Hooney's actually just not spent any money. He just stayed in lane the whole time. Yeah. So that is a TP down in case there is a fight bot side. Hooney, you know, building up some rage. Uh, doesn't seem that like we'll have a fight right away, but has the opportunity. Yeah, mostly concerned with the fact that, that TP is down because that just signals you can make a play on the bottom side of the map. Of course, it is Tom Kench, so it's much harder to actually have one kind of stick. Right. And I feel like Hooney probably just wants to stay and bully this lane more so than TP, especially since it's an Ocean Drake. It's not a high-priority Drake at all. But that teleport is something that we do have to always track because it's something that as soon as it's down, it's, a, it's actually a very distinct advantage for the other top laner. Let's see if that comes through then. All right now we go back to the duo lane fighting back and forth. The Blista did get her back off, of course, and the farm got a bit more equalized. No surprises here. First TP in the mid lane. Comes in for PoE. He's got himself a little bit more magic resist to survive some of these encounters. Still three more stacks of his dematerializer available as well. Phoenix happily stacking up his tier. Very similar items across these players. Got a right. pretty low event early game, which I feel like in general very slightly favors Zach, just because he actually kind of wants to hit six, I feel like. And could be injured in the jungle. Doesn't end up having that happen to him. He's actually slightly out farming Acadian, so pretty solid by Dardock. Yeah, Pony uses that teleport as well, just to try and get an item advantage after backing with more gold. You can just stick in the lane with the fleet footwork and be okay. Yeah. And the, kind of the only action that's been going on is a uh, slight jungler action, I would say, where Dardock, with the tracker's knife, was able to track the top side jungle of Acadian for like the past few minutes here. Uh, and it allowed Optic who haven't been placing wards very deep themselves. They're mostly shallow wards. They've been warding up around mid lane. They had multiple control wards there. So they had control ward advantage around that area. Uh, but Fox were really just tracking Acadian, making sure he didn't get any ganks off. Yeah. They're definitely as aware as, as we are mm -hmm. of the fact that Acadian's one game he's won was on that Kha'Zix where he was able to kind of pop off. Yeah, and he's got good laners to gank for, so we talked about that champ select. The competition is pretty solved for this one. Looking again at top lane, 15 CS lead for Huni after they've made their various recalls and teleports back. And Huni's starting to get some real chips in this turret as well. He's not really threatened by Zig. Getting some auto attack trying to trigger Hyper and whatnot, but that turret's down to about 80%. Again, Lamation just having to chomp Arrow to get him out, but the Ren's still going to come through if he wants it. I'll take you to not hit the button. And Zig is going to, uh, just feels like he's going to keep losing farm fully, but surely minus 13 right now. The, the wave push is just so easy right now for hooting this top side. Zig walks down to ward behind him. He knows his health is a bit lower. And at the same time, Dardock with all this pressure, including from the bot lane as they're pushing into turret, gets to go for a pretty early Drake. Except Minute Ocean's pretty solid. Yeah, they, when he's fine, he's gonna get damage on that top turret. And this is one of those things where usually when you're on the bottom side of the map doing a dragon, your top laner will back off. But they just have such confidence and know the location of Acadian, where they're just like, all right, we can just have Pony push and we can do this. So mm -hmm. the fact that they have that knowledge really helps them out across the map. All right, now early game is going pretty solid for Echo Fox. This is a team that had actually had difficulties getting through the early game for uh, both this week and last, but this one feeling a bit better for them, and they're just not being challenged yet. Yeah, no kills, no turrets, but it's a thousand gold lead plus a Drake with without any real blood spill. Acadian's looking for a double stealth here. He'll yeah. go straight through the brush, and because he has that control board, he's not going to get spotted, but yeah, there we go. Looks like he's just going to actually go away. Too much time wasted. Phoenix playing safely enough, just not getting ganked, and just, you know, really solid play by him. Which is interesting, because Echo Fox usually expects to be a very aggressive team, but here it seems like they're just saying, we slightly win both of these lanes, let's just play it safe and just have these advantages pile on, right? The 20 CS advantage that they have in the top lane, the 13 that they have in the mid lane, and then even down bottom, you really don't have to do much right now if you're Echo Fox, except stick to these lanes, because no objectives or kills have gone down, and there's still a thousand gold up. Yep, pretty solid for these guys. Oh. Here comes the first big play. Optic gonna come in for this one on the top side. They bring Tom Kench around behind Hooney, but they actually already recalled the Maokai. He's not part of the gang. Yeah. So they're gonna 2v1 him, but Hooney's got some decent ways out. Here comes Rise. Here comes Akaden as well. Jumps over the wall. Flash uh -huh. the follow. Go for the 2 on 1 on Hooney as Dardock comes across as well, but now he's a bit alone as Hooney runs away. Hooney almost dead. 
but does stay alive as Phoenix rejoins the fight. The flash, the ult to get over the wall, and that Zack will stay safe. Garda gets out. In the meantime, that bot lane turret had already fallen. I do have to question the fact that Zig didn't stay for that fight to get them maybe a better chance to kill, but Echo Fox hit themselves first turtle game. You definitely have to question it because Zig backed and he still didn't even make it to bottom turret in time to wave clear or do anything about that wave. If he's able to save that bottom turret, then maybe it's worth it, but he wasn't. So Echo Fox gets to kind of get everything off that fight. Some stuff right here. 2,000 now makes it the gold lead. Good escapes out of Echo Fox. We do burn a couple of summoners for it. Two flash on their side. And Elimination burns his double summoners as well. At least Arrow gets some alone time with this top lane out of turret. He's going start burning it down. Nice little smite pickup. Akadian grabs it off of uh, Echo Fox's hard work. Ult goes backwards. Not optimal for Adrian, I do believe. It's interesting as well because Optic actually had a uh, 3v2 there and they didn't decide to commit harder to it. It's kind of like a touch and go game for both teams right now, but for Fox, it's definitely more, they're trying to play a little bit of the keep away and keep these lanes because they're just slowly winning. Whereas Optic, it just seems like a little bit hesitant. Doesn't look like they want to really have anybody kind of mess up or risk messing up. Red buff Big. though, Huni's got red. Yeah, he knows he's in danger. He burned the ult for some disengage. That turret's gone and via the slow going to make Huni walk away. And Meganar not the best chaser compared to what a ranged uh, form can do. So out he goes, but yeah, the farm's getting worse. The turret's getting down. A long time to go until next Drake, so we'll see how this 2-1-G matches up topside. But Huni has a lot of room to work with. Uh, not going to use that to get a blue buff steal, though. Kiwi's going to get that without any problems. Theoretically, you can use it for that. I just saw the Gnar come up and didn't find himself the steal. Huni looked, though. I really like when a top laner has that type of advantage in their matchup that they can just go into the jungle and start taking camps, right? It's one of those ways in solo queue, you oh, definitely push it. Right behind him, though. 2-1-2 two gets away from the stun. Akita going to slow it up, pulled right back in as well, jumps away. Should stay alive in this one. I think he still has you know, no more ult charges left for him, but a nice attempt to engage. Nothing to be had, though. Very touch and go once again. And Acadian now looking towards the bottom side because Huni's actually pushed up a bit. And he's just skirting by still. Jumps into the bush. Acadian's coming around as well, though. They're going to grab that smite. Snipes it away. Gromp goes back to Optic here. But yeah, Huni really able to just play. A 1v2 even fights walls. 1v3. Yeah, this is a, a scary game for Acadian because as the Kha'Zix, you really do want to have at least some kills fall into the hands of yourself or your team early and to put the enemies behind because then they're going to be squishier for longer. Right here, though. The attempt. Knockup going to find just the one, but here comes Dronakin as well. So a 3 versus 2. Going to spit arrow right back out, but pulled right back in. Now Kiss, and this is the 2 to get away. The nice pullback as well near the turret. The rest of the team comes in. First blood comes through. No way out. The next one, Dogma, gonna fall down. The double kill for Altec. They have the confidence to go for that play because they saw Akkadian bottom side from Huni's pressure, and now they're gonna get this turret on top of it. This looks like the Echo Fox that was 4-0 coming into the week. There's really nothing in their way whatsoever. They're finding the openings. They're finding the aggressive plays. They're winning their lanes. Second turret's gonna go down, and right now they're completely shutting out Optic. No kills, no turrets, no neutrals. And this is one of those situations that feels a little bit helpless because of matchups. And Echo Fox, like you said, it's more calculated. They were falling into some deficits in their last few games, the last three, because of being overly aggressive. And here, they're just calculated about the aggression. We see somebody on the bottom side, the jungler, no way he can counter this play, engage, and they pull the trigger with Dardock, Adrian, and Altec to make it a two on three, and knowing that the Kha'Zix couldn't possibly be here. You know, I actually, I feel like I'm gonna harp this player a lot. I feel like Lamation misplayed that fight, though. He should have let Arrow tank the stun, then grab him. Instead of being crowd girls as Tom Kench, let Kogma take the one target hard CC, then grab him out of the sun and walk away. He actually could have built, built more distance there. It's a really minor point, but sometimes it really does matter. And I feel like we're seeing just honestly a few cracks in Lemonations play overall. And for how good Arrow is playing, I think that is a weakness of Optic here. Yeah. And if you had the opportunity, it's one of those ones where Tom Kent, you can actually keep the person in your belly for a pretty long time. I think it goes up to six seconds later on. Yeah. Spit him over the bottom wall. Hit him towards Acadian, right? Don't go up, go down, because Acadian was coming up. Yeah, true. Well, it's the way it is, though. 2-0 right now to Echo Fox. Their lead up to 4,500 now. Another attempted play near the mid lane, but look at this Phoenix hugging the top left side away from where the gank would be coming so from. interesting, because his jungler's on the bottom right side. Yeah. What's Normally, you on? cheat this way. That's where they are right now. Ward of the Wall spots what's happening. Infernal Brick being hit right now. Arrow does have Rage Blade, so power spike in for this Kog'Maw can definitely kill a frontline. 
If he's left untouched, but Adrian and Altic nearby. Dardox charging up. Here comes the team fight as TP comes in for Huni. Into the back line they go. He's grounded. Looking for the damage and an arrow. He's going to flash to stay alive. And Dardox not going to get too much for this one. As the ulti comes across from Zig as well. One man stun from Cassiopeia. Zig forced to flash right back away. The oh. big Meganar comes across. Two stuns. Two more kills come through. Four so far. Looking for five and six. Oh, it's not going to be a pinch of kills. Two more go off to other teammates. But six to zero Echo Fox will not be stopped. Echo Fox is like, you have no business taking this Drake. They were almost all there, and then Huni just TPs down. They don't get the Drake immediately, but it doesn't matter. They have so much going on in this game for Echo Fox. It's because they're playing it smart. The charge comes in, another turret gonna fall. All three outers down at 17 minutes and six seconds. This Infernal Drake, an easy solo for Dardock as well. Ah, uh, Cadian's right over the wall. He's not an award per se, so it would be a guess. They see, Kadian is! They see Kadian, Kadian is, but Jardox yeah. not is what I meant, sorry. Uh, yeah, so they don't know when it's happening or what's uh, going on there. Boy. Megan Arc oh. throws up, hello with Kadian, hello with Promise. Well, he's not invisible. Dodge the clock tower, he's gonna be fine, I think. Yep, he's gonna live. And there's the Drake finally going down. Jardox spent about seven minutes on that one. No one helped Chill. him. Typical toxic teammates. Hey, hey, nobody had to help him there. I know. But yeah, like this engage from Dardock, he gets the flash out of arrow and he ends up hitting a pretty good spot of the fight as well. But then Alti still ends up getting two people a little bit further back. But this is really the Huni entrance is the big part where he gets the Gnar into the wall for two. And then immediately they're saying, go next target. And they keep pushing there. Really nice of them. I really do. I think the Echo Fox team fighting is quite solid. Of course, we'd seen the mic check from them before when they beat up TSM. That went well for him also. And it's a squad that just hasn't missed a beat since yesterday. And I've talked to Adrian about his team, and he just constantly talks about how you know, it's so easy being on this team for him because everybody has the same mindset, right? They know when to play safe, and then they know that they all want to take fights to get back into the game or to push the, uh, the tempo, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very aggressive team, but they're all aligned in it. You don't have those missed calls where one person's running back. Usually it's... People are engaging at different points instead yeah. of on the same target. So getting people aligned is really the big thing for them. And you can see that they all have that same mindset in these fights. That's a really good team to watch, definitely. They were in first place for a while for a reason. Basically, Still Fox tied. Fox. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're still kind of in first place, to be honest. And, and they'll actually temporarily have uh, sole control briefly as the, this game winds up. It's almost impossible to lose at this point. But of course, we've seen bigger upsets happen and bigger comebacks happen. Echo Fox is part of one on the other side themselves. Yeah, it was like, oh, almost never see it. We've seen a lot this split. Yeah. This, this year's been a bit different. Teams have been slow to close out sometimes. Here comes the frontline access. Adrian loses 300 health and forces Acadian away as Drodok is back the lane. Turret's going to go down 5-0 to zero now on that score line. And the gold lead becomes an almost even 10,000. At 19 minutes, that is ludicrous. Yeah. It's definitely what you call a major lead there. <laughs> so far, yeah. it's... Uh, that is well beyond Major League. Yeah, 10,000. That's like, com wait, what's above Major? Commander? <laughs> General League? I'm unsure. Don't ask yeah, me. Yeah, we're going to move on. <laughs> but more of the camp's going to go away. Drada gets a solo a red buff in opposing territory. Acadian says, hi, you're killing my red buff. Oh, that's a Cassie P. Never mind. And he's going to go check. Yep. Acadian still, he hasn't been able to get anything done in this game. And he hasn't been able to go towards those lanes and gank them with the gank assist. It looked like Optic, even though they were slowly losing lanes and bleeding out, they didn't force anything. They didn't go for any flash plays because they didn't yeah. have vision of where Dardock was most of the time. Dardock got to track Acadian, but most of Optic's vision was shallow yeah. to protect their own jungle. You're right, the words weren't great. I saw them try for Phoenix a few times, but it never quite worked. Obviously, Cassie also brought Cleanse this game, so even the Empowered Rise route wouldn't have mattered. And You're right, even though Acadian looked, there was never the opening, never could quite find it. Huni seemed to have pretty good ward coverage as well via his teammates. And yeah. Those ganks never came through, sadly. We talked about the gank assist and champ select. The ganks never found themselves in this game. It's one of those hard things to kind of calculate in the moment because you're looking for a better time. But then if you miss it, you eventually go, okay, that was the best time I was going to get. It wasn't a very good time to go, but yeah. it was probably the best we were going to get. But in that moment, you were thinking, oh, there's probably we'll another later. opportunity coming up. Yeah, it can be tough. And hindsight's off in 2020, but in this case, it's 6 0 so far for Echo Fox and Optic are just. Hoping that they won't be the first perfect game in the split, but... And yeah, we've had shutouts. Don't know if we had a perfect game yet, and there's a TP. Oh, okay, they're gonna bring one to safety. He's gonna go back in the front line. Adrian really wants to make sure his teammate stays safe. Puts in a couple of slows, puts the ulti down, and disengages fine. Yeah, the disengage is completely fine. When that looked like it was gonna be a collapse of five versus three for a brief moment. So it's really good from both Altec and Adrian to actually make that happen. 
Zig did not have flash up either. It's coming up in just a few seconds here. Yeah. Well, now I'm curious how aggressive Echo Fox wants to play because they just lost both of their bot lane ultimates. If they wait a minute and a half, that says, okay, we're going to play safely. Let's wait till we have all five R buttons, then go from there. But if they take a fight anyway, just because the gold lead, I don't think it's wrong. You're up so much, you don't necessarily need all your ultimates, but it does incur a bit more risk because you have less tools in the team fight. Right now, they're just kind of mopping up the jungle. So nothing to be talked about just yet. But again, we're only, I'm going to look at the timer, 81 seconds and 70 seconds for the Braum and Callista ultimates, respectively, till they're back up. Yeah, not too long at all. I actually like here, um, something that changed in the 8.2 patches, you don't have to completely rush your Sightstone upgraded item. And we can see Ooh, next play on the side. All right, TP comes in for Huni, three on three at the very beginning of this one, as uh, the Rise is far away, though, so Huey can't be part of the fight just yet. They found Lemonation for some more damage. The shield comes up. He's not going to find this one. Another kill for Altec, that one's stoppable. And that was a pretty easy pickup there as Huni teleported in to make sure it was all safe. Yeah, flanked by a single Tom Kench, and then the rest of the team is on your right. I'm pretty sure you just go on the Tom Kench. He yep. didn't deliver anybody there. That was like that brief moment of hesitation at the start. Like, does he have anybody in his belly? That's all it took was for them to say, nope, immediately turn on to him, and with him down, even yeah. though Acadian's up, they're still going to look at this. 10k gold plus 5 to B4 as Huni holds the front line. He is Meganar available, and no one's going to come around to steal that one. So Baron Asher picked up now at 2244. Out goes Arrow. Phoenix going to find some damage, but not go for any kills. And another objective goes for Echo Fox. Looking at that perfect game here. Yeah. No turrets, no drakes given over, no rift no, herald, no objectives at all. Not even kills. They're looking Rise, for one, though. They got flank. flash. Okay, Phoenix. Well, none of his team is nearby. So he's got to really book it right now. The flash in for Zig cleanses up. He's going to flash over the wall, though. But here comes Acadian plus the root. He's going to try to live. And oh, perfect oh. game. Oh, he's oh, going to get AD. Kill the run away. 5 HP. He's healing. And he goes down. Power of Evil knocks down Phoenix. The dream is dead. And Phoenix is a feeder. Oh, man. Still, he made him work for that one, he though. Did. They got the one on the board, but he made him work. And you can see Fox, they're still going. And they're going to find that second kill of the fight. Now looking for number three as Zig is holding the front line pretty nicely. A big ulti coming across. Hooney taking the damage up, but a kill comes through for Arrow. The Cogba, they needed him to make it work. Looking for Adrian next. The snipe comes in. That's three kills in a row now for Optic. Meanwhile, Alltech was actually pushing mid, and that's why they're able to turn it around. It's because it's a numbers flip-flop fight in favor of Optic, and Arrow is just able to output the DPS. And that's what Optic were hoping for in Champion Select, is a two item or plus Kogma actually damaging champions. Problem is they lost 10k gold before they could get into that first team fight. But that's where that comeback hope comes in, is you look for that and pray it happens. The pull back onto Acadian. And they're going to go for another fight, actually, as the team's cutting away. Arrow really wanted to find someone to kill. Well, they're pushing in here because this is exactly where you want to be anyway with an Infernal Drake up. So Optic. They got three kills. The perfect yeah. game is long gone. And the opponents are really far away. Phoenix walking in. Huni just spawned up right now. Now Jarak in the front line. This is a 5v3 that could be what? won right now. They're going to find the passive down. This is going to be more and more kills actually going towards Optic. As Echo Fox takes the fight without their team as the first kill comes through. They're going to get the second one as well. And Phoenix is alone. He shouldn't be in this fight at all. What's and the Rise Dolt is going to find them another one. Off the game. They're going to look for it. They're going to juke away from the ultimate perfect plan of power. V with a flash forward. They're going to find five straight kills now. Make it six actually. Six straight for Optic. What is going on? Fox are just completely s staggered in their respawns, and they just come out, and it's one by one. Dardock leaps in, and they are not on the same page anymore. There Unless was that page never, is let's all die. There was never a reason to choose that fight. Huni and Adrian were dead when the dragon was hit. They engaged a 2v5, and Dardock thought it was a good idea. But Optic, that puts them in a position, like you said, with they're getting those item points where they're starting to get more and more here. It's still 10k gold advantage oh, it was a lot for though. Fox, so yeah. a lot of ground to cover. But Fox here, ooh. And they know it's 2v5. Yeah, they absolutely know that. Lemonation comes in, exhaust on the Alltech, just gobbles him up, spits him out, and then he just gets burst and they pick up Phoenix afterwards. So yeah, it's completely staggered in terms of the respawns here for Echo Fox, that looked like they were just trying to keep the tempo up, where it's like, all right, boys, we're back in there. Yeah. But with staggered people coming into the fight, it's not going to work at all. See, so many people are like, oh, it's Infernal Drake. We've got to fight the Infernal Drake. This is every solo queue game ever. 2v5, let's go. It's, it's, it's like six attack damage. Calm down, everyone. It's OK. I like that question that you asked. Uh, on the NALCS yeah. lounge in the week one. How many kills is the Drake worth? Yeah, I was like, how many kills is it worth? And 
Pony said zero. Pony Even said zero. Infernal. Yeah. But well, he wasn't alive. Wasn't his choice. Yeah. But for Infernal, he's like, ooh, maybe one, but maybe. not me, right? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Not my life. Well, definitely wasn't him dying in that one. But of course, it's still Echo Fox with a lot of lead in this one, and honestly, it's still like 95%. They close one out. So we'll see when the siege continues yet again. No Baron on the map, no Drake, obviously, but with almost 11,000 gold, you expect this to push a little bit further forward. Open inhibitor in the middle lane as well. Nice smite for Acadian. Let's see what kind of comp they go for. Looks like 1-3-1. One, one. Puni top side, Phoenix bottom. Up against the Rise, who's still running that cleanse. He doesn't have the TP to join, but he does have the ultimate. Has the Zonius completed as well. Mm -hmm. Very safe. Right, mid lane siege. They've brought Phoenix into the mid lane. How good do they feel about pushing in for territory? Arrow's been so good so far this split. Had some pretty good team fights himself. Yeah, but if they want to start something, it's pretty much coming from Zig or I yeah. guess Lemonation. You could deliver Zig to the back line with Power of Evil's ultimate and get pretty yeah. clever with it. But right now, Fox have a lot of the engage and disengage tools in the composition. Yep. And they have the upper hand in the map control. And they felt safe enough to siege mid lane, and Optic knew enough to say, yeah, we got to get this one away, and that means Inhibitor will be down for the duration of Baron spawning, and even for most of the buff afterwards. Because Echo Fox are going to have that one extra point of power beyond just the gold lead to keep map objectives in their favor. Switching over to the bot lane for a little bit as well, as again, the Baron is going to be a while till it comes up, so they can actually dedicatedly siege this bot lane for about 45 seconds and then switch out. They will have TB on Huni. Same for Optic with Zig. Yeah, but Fox, it looks like, you know, no fear was struck in them by what happened earlier. Constant aggression, constant pressure still. Even if they had that one fight where everybody was a little bit offbeat with one another, they're still just back at it. No hesitation here in the bushes. Right, so four in the bot lane as the mid is left alone with the dead inhibitor. Quick slow on all tech, but he's got more or less alone to have knocked the turret down. Adrian blocks a lot of the attacks right there. Says no. Kogma, you don't get to deal damage to our backline. And that turns down a half HP. Meanwhile, Huni actually playing very defensively in topside. He knows the threat of the Rise ulti flank and everything else like that. PoE, yep. He's going to find a little bit something there with the ward. Huni knows he has to play respectfully. Akadian's actually lurching through this top jungle as well. He's still pinging it. Yeah, that's actually what a lot of Kha'Zix end up doing in these split push scenarios, is they get to shadow a split pusher. And you see him actually go back. So yeah, you want to you want to shadow the split pusher as Kha'Zix. So it's one of the things where like a one three one composition or a four one actually shouldn't really work that well against the Kha'Zix that's hovering around the split pushers and can go between the two main groups. A couple of wards come down. Elimination spots the Baron pit as well as the entrance to it as that's spawning in 20 seconds. Zig and Huni most likely will sit in the bottom lane now for themselves. It's, they have teleport. They can rejoin the fight when the Baron actually begins. Squad's gonna have to be around the top and mid side so they can play around that objective. Spawns in five seconds, and again, it's it's up to Echo Fox, right? They are the team with the 11,000 gold lead. They're the one who's gonna be the drivers here in this, and how they set it up is gonna dictate how the game is played. And I'm watching Acadian at this Baron very closely. He has stopwatch still. He's the only person who still has their stopwatch 29, almost 30 minutes into the game. And it gets pushed out. Of course, Arrow, thankfully, on Kogma is a very good uh, super minion killer. Deals some magic damage. That helps a lot. They have negative MR. That gets booted away. Huni looking for a bit of a play here. Jumps forward. Finds a slow and an ulti out from Ryze. They don't want to be part of this fight at all, but that is one tool missing. On to Phoenix. Oh, and they get Phoenix's flash away. That's actually a pretty nice play. And honestly, that's a positive for PUE. It's a shorter cooldown to use that. But Jardok wants back in for this fight. Not going to find too much as Zig flashes over. But now PUE is isolated. Gets slowed down as well. Could there be much of a fight as Ziggles to disengage the rest of the squad? And the Fox finds themselves a couple of roots here. Turning away. Acadian waiting in the flank, though. Here comes the engagement again for Jardik. They find Lemonation. Knocked up into the air, but Ooh. dropped away. Sorry, that was looking for Huni. Liner, but here comes the chase on in. Free time for Arrow to spike. And he's going to get one kill as Huni is down. Acadian in the back. Oro and Acadian looks for a little bit more, but it's a one for one as Lemonation has fallen. So 4v4 on this fight. Health bar is a bit low for Echo Fox. They're just going to run away. and. Look at the threat that Kog'Maw can bring at 10,000 gold lead and you lose your front line. And some of that, honestly, is Huni's build. Yes. It's high damage, all health, which is exactly perfect for what Kog'Maw wants to deal damage. Exactly. Has the Sterics. Look at this opening on Phoenix. Half HP already on him. Can the 4v4 look any better? It's all about Arrow, really, with that W on. And, of course, an untouched rise can do that kind of stuff, too. The front line's still pretty durable for Echo Fox, though. Both Zack and Braum pretty solid at this.
and especially with the lead that they've had in this game, it's still that 10,000 gold lead for them. And we aren't at that point where anybody has six items, so we weren't looking at, like, advantages that don't mean anything. At this point, people are still going towards those builds. Right now, they see the Baron being started, Acadian in the wings right here. Damage coming through, he doesn't help. He's gonna get smite, and it's gonna go over! Acadian grabs the Baron! Echo Fox, with all the leads, choose to go for a 50-50. They lose the bet and opt to get closer to this game. That right there is just Echo Fox. Ever since that fight, like the, well, I'll say the 20-minute mark, it's less calculated. Everything up until that point where we're looking at the perfect game, it's calculated aggression. Now, it just seems so scattered in terms of where everybody is and what they want to be doing but it is still aggressive. And that's where Optic are finding their opportunities, is off the hubris of Echo Fox. He really is. So, it's a three item cog by now. He was there on Rune King before the last fight. He's gonna get a little bit bigger now over time. Four item on this Callisto. We can watch this fight again. The flash away from Zig. It looks like Power Beeple is gonna be in a position where he can't get out, but he runs around the side and you have Zig's ulti coming through, so everybody bunches up and it still delays them. But when Huni jumps in, he just gets CC locked. And that's the thing that I'm looking for here, is because he could really devastate the back line with an ulti. But you see, stunned, rooted, rooted by the rise, and he doesn't get hit, he doesn't get to press the, rock, the R there. Looks like he wanted to. And then, yeah, the re-engage comes through for Elimination Fell, but support for top lane are pretty much worth it. Yeah, there's no vision here. And then they see him just barely right before. Oh! Early smite by Dardoch, the smite timed right by Akkadi, and really nicely done by him. Uh, but you have a Callista, so I'm gonna blame the AD carry on this one. So, in my so, no, 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 it's fine. <laughs> uh, we can, if the game slows down, we'll have the discussion because I actually have some opinions on how Ren Smite should work together. Um, but that's fine. So we do have some downtime, and honestly, since Optic are gonna probably camp on this Baron in far mid, I want to talk about the theory of Smite Ren. So on the one hand, yes, you should, you know, you can say, okay, at, at 1200 or whatever, hit the button at the same time, they're both instant cast, you get the last hit. Oh. What I will point out, though, is if your team is high damage, you don't get to lodge a bunch of spears in. And there's a cast UP, which means your team is high damage. So all text red is probably only like 750, which, especially with a double zeal build here, so it's not that high because uh, of how many spears you got to lodge. Alternatively, if you do get like a thousand damage rend available, smite early and just let him rend at like 1100 because there's no way you screw that up at that point. Instead of trying to like hit them at the same time and hope the other smite's not in between, you just go one and one and then it, like that's an easy way to do it. As a jungler, I disagree with you. It is your job as Callista. I'm just gonna, I'll keep the guy out of the pit. That's what I'll do. Okay, then keep him out of the pit, <laughs> Dardoch. <laughs> but 80 carries fault on that one. All right, you know what? It's all Altex's fault. Let's move on. Worst lane, worst roll. We're all garbage players. Let's be real about this one. Four kill lead for Echo Fox. The gold lead still sits at 10,000. At a certain point, that 10k means less and less. We're running out of item slots pretty soon. Only one slot to go for Phoenix and Power of Evil. About as much for Arrow and Altsec the same. Phoenix has two, actually. He's got oh, you're right. I just... No boots. I blanked. No, my brain is bad. It's okay. Altsec's almost full, though. There you go. And that's going to start hurting. Once he gets to full build and you can no longer buy any more items, that gold starts shrinking rapidly in actual value. And that's going to be something that happens, and I would say about like 10 minutes, where you're hitting that full build on Phoenix. Um, yeah. A little bit sooner for Power of Evil, but at that point, like Optic have to hold on to this game. The Baron is only going to help them for about 10 more seconds here, and the Elder Dragon will be up shortly in, I would say, you know, five-ish minutes, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, something to be very wary of then. Of course, Echo Fox has a much better Elder Dragon than Optic would. It's about twice as powerful for them. I do like the scaling of Optic, though. They have really good scaling. The Rise, the Kogma, and the Maokai, I think, all really do wonders. Yeah. It's very hard to reach the Kogma in these team fights. There, there is engage tools, but as long as Lemonation and Arrow are paying attention, he will never be kidnapped by that Zac. Here we go. Middle and here we're going to fall once again. And this is still Optic understanding a 10,000 gold deficit and the fact that there's no turret defending. Echo going to move on to top side though, and once again, we try to see how good they're going to be at closing this game out. Like I said, reaching that Kogma is so hard, because there's so many roots in your way, and then the Tom Kench on top of it. And with the engage that Echo Fox has, they really do have Dardoch jumping in, and then Adrian with Altex uh, ultimate. But Huni, we just saw him try to engage in that last fight, and he didn't really have the resistances or the tankiness to do it, even as Meganar yet. So getting to Arrow, you really do have to have that one swift punch land, but then Lemonation is going to eat him up. So you need a 1-2 against this team. We'll see if that second Priest can come through. Uh, Adrian gets trolled by Zeddy Carey, continuing the trend that we are the worst kind of players in the game. 
scumbag STT Callista. Maybe he'll play against them at some point. Echo Fox uh, looking like one of the stronger teams in North America. They might make some international competition. That'd be really cool for them. Man, you were jumping to some stuff in week three. I'm like, <laughs> best of hey, ones are back. They were I'm undefeated like, coming in. I said 18 no quote me, I was wrong. Maybe they'll go 18 at Worlds, who knows? That would be a trip. And he would win something, it'd be great. Uh, that's unlikely though. So Echo Fox gonna make the next moves pretty soon. Elder Dragon up in 115. The Baron not far behind it. But the DC is long enough that they could go for one than the other. Yeah. I mean, they should control the neutral game. Yeah, especially since the fact that that inhibitor is down mid, right? You should yeah. be pushed in as Optic. And Optic are just looking to farm. And this is that breaking point I was talking about where, sure, you want to just back up and farm and play defensively as Optic, but there are such huge objectives outside of your base that you're going to be forced to face check some areas to push forward unless yep. you just want to give them up uncontested, which increases the likelihood that Fox win a fight or even just a forced engage. It makes sense. We'll see then if Drawdot can once again be the breaking point here in this one as he can find the engage and maybe get the smite to control the Elder Dragon. And or all tech can land his rend on time. I don't know. Any of the above could happen. It'd be crazy, but... As the time ticks down, 30 seconds on Elder Dragon. Again, that should be where the moment really strikes. You can see Huni splitting top side. They know that the bottom is where the main fight is because it'll TP to that side of the map. And so pretty much wherever Huni is, the opposite of the map, that's where Kavok wants to fight. Yeah, and Huni wants to keep Zig over there because Zig is a large part of the primary engage for Optic if they wanted to start a fight or even just kind of peel backwards. The Maokai is a large part of that. So Huni's just going to keep pushing top. Mm -hmm. And now you're in that catch-22 situation as Optic. You're going to lose something top, and now they're sending Power of Evil over there. Interesting. So having the Rise battle him with the rest of the team around, and of course, PoE still has cleanse and not TP, so he can't join right away. And here comes the beginning of the Elder Dragon. Three of them on it already. They know who can TP. He's actually backed off to be in TP if he needs it. He won't get his channel canceled. And look how badly zoned, badly zoned they are, I should say. Phoenix puts down the Miasma. So there's no chance. Misses the Rend. Who expected it? Last hit goes to Phoenix. Bench him. All tech's no good. <laughs> Let the Baron up in five seconds here. Don't want to talk about those types of things. <laughs> it's not my job to do that. <laughs> and Anero, you got work cut out for you, buddy. Teach him how to play, and now on the Baron they go. All right, so they've got the Elder Dragon Burn on. They do plenty of damage, and look at... Yeah, that's not going to be a contest. Map. Optic completely seed the map, and that's a tough call to make. It's such a tough call to make, because Elder Dragon turns so easily into Baron, and Echo Fox played the vision well enough that they just kept the team from doing anything. And this next Siege is going to be insanely powerful. Yeah, and this is where for Optic, you have to say, where do we make our last stand? When do we make our last stand? When yeah. is the best opportunity to do it? If it was a moment ago where they're trying to get <laughs> Elder Dragon again, you were just scumbags, <laughs> all 80 carries. It's just all tech. He's like the most mild bandit of all of them, too. And he's like, no, 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 I'm going to scumbag Adrianus every time I can talked about Echo Fox, how, you know, people were, like, focusing on, oh, these guys have egos, and they thought, like, you know, Huni, Dardock, maybe a little bit Phoenix. It's Avery. actually it's like, all no, the whole time. That's the one. <laughs> no, but we'll see here as they push up on the bottom side of the map. Oh, man, Echo Fox just have such large advantages here. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm talking about with the whole, when are you going to make your last stand and how are you going to make it? Because that might have been your best opportunity at that Elder Dragon. And now Optic have to go up against an Elder Dragon buffed and Baron well, buffed up. The team. Play. But they're going for Huni here. So he's going to try to give him the slip. He's going to be a bit of a 1v3, a Caden over the wall. He's actually back to Mininar as well, so not a lot of escape tools outside of Flash. Arrow's nearby. This could be the damage. They're going to sack a turret for this, though. And actually, Arrow can't keep up. There's no more slows available. So bot lane turret plus inhibitor is gone. And the engage coming forward. They're going to find not a stun, but a knock up there on the support. And a bit of damage on Pee-wee then flash forward. He's going to pop Zoni, but has no ulti to escape on this one. This damage is going to come through pretty easily. The flash away, but he's still going to get shot down. The first kill comes through. The mid laner is gone from Optic. And this will be the fight that wins the game. Two kills already. Nothing going to stop them anymore as that comes forward. A double kill for Huni, and no one is up to kill anybody anymore. As the ace comes through, clean five for zero. And Echo Fox had to sweat a bit, but they made it come down five to one and the week in first place. You can't say they didn't make it interesting. But that mid game was concerning, absolutely. The early game, it looked so free. They played it really well. No kills, but a huge farm lead that got the turrets. And they were on pace for a perfect game. There were 10 minutes in the middle that were just so chaotic and unfitting of a 4 and one team. I actually had no idea what was going on. I didn't it was, either. It was <laughs> stupid. <laughs> but they made it happen in the end. Hugs and handshakes from people. Oh. Yeah. Old teammates there between Adrian and Arrow back on Phoenix 1. Yeah.
It also means, though, another week ending in ninth place here for Optic. One in five for them, and nothing was able to happen from the early game. They, they couldn't get anything to come through, even despite the Kha'Zix pick. You know, they did their win condition, tank yep. top, assassin jungler, but none of that early pressure came through. Arrow had some good moments in team fights, power up evil the same, but they were just outclassed, it felt like, even just in the pure laning phase here. And this is why I say win conditions are not just drafts. Nope, right. they're not. You can draft a, a stellar composition, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, you still have to be able to play and find those pockets that you need to operate in. Yep. And make sure that you're actually playing not just to your win condition of the draft, but playing around those areas and making sure, like, we had roots in those lanes. They never forced anything. They said, okay, let's back up. But then Optic got to a point where the lead was just too enormous for them to actually do anything in that game. And that's why it kind of slowly got away from them. And like I've said, they missed the window, which probably would have been their best opportunity for a fight. Yeah, I tend to agree. And, and even though they did receive a couple of openings there uh, from Echo Fox with, with all the missteps in the mid game, even with the Baron still coming in, right, they, they chose to farm through the Baron, which I think is probably the right choice with how far behind they were, get more and more gold onto Arrow. But I think if, if you're going to give up Elder Dragon and Baron, I think you probably just instantly lose at that point. I, I think like that's too big of a power spike to ever expect to win a fight in the base. They maybe had to try for that. Either way, it is a loss for Optic Gaming. And now we're going to send it down to Avali May and Echo Fox's man on stage for pick and bans. Thanks, guys. I am here with Coach Nero. I want to ask you, watching these games from backstage, what is that entire experience like? Uh, well, games like that, pretty stressful, honestly. Like, you see you got a huge lead, and then the team suddenly is uh, starting to lose. Uh, it's, it's nice. I enjoy it, but games like that suck. They're stressful. Now, everyone was waiting for it to happen. Everyone was waiting to see what would happen to Echo Fox after they took their first loss, and you had that yesterday. What happened after the game, and how were you guys able to come together and pull off today's win? Yeah, everyone expects us to implode, but everyone's just like, yeah, we suck. Like, we screwed up in the game. It's our fault we lost. So we'll just come back and we'll win tomorrow. Everyone was happy. They knew coming into the game we had, like, a really good shot at it. So it, it didn't affect us too much, as much as people would think, really. Did you guys have to regather mentality, or was it just you guys were just ready to take on the next day? No, there was no, like, regathering mentality. Everyone was just ready. They were just like, yeah, it happens. We'll get over it. Like, at least we learned how to lose now rather than, all right, we got the playoffs first loss. That sucks, right? So... Now, I'm curious a little bit about Echo Fox's drafting process. We heard uh, Coach Zabutin said that he just lets his players pick what they want to do and they go from there. But what's Echo Fox like? Um, yeah, no, we don't do that at all. We have like a pretty, a pretty clear process with all of our pick ban. Um, so me and Thinkard, who's the uh, assistant coach with everything, uh, we plan out like every draft scenario possible. So you'll see us do insta locks a lot. Um, that just shows like we know exactly what they would do, so we're ready for it. But um, Players have input. Obviously, we take preference into account. But yeah, no, we don't just let players lock it in like that. Now, when I've interviewed your players before on what they think makes the team so successful, they're like, yeah, we have a lot of hard work and teamwork together, friendship. From a coaching perspective, what do you think makes Echo Fox so successful? Um, from us, just all the players are friends. We have friendship there. Uh, so that makes everything really easy. And they all just want to win. So you don't even have to try to push these like out of game things to get everyone on the same page. They're already there. So we can just focus on like getting to that same goal, and it's really easy that way. Well, thank you so much for your time. Back to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you, Avali. I'm sure Enero was clutching his chest at moments during <laughs> that game, a game that probably could have ended about 15 yeah. minutes sooner. Echo Fox still able to pick up the W, though, in the end to move to 5-1 and one and had that recovery game after the loss yesterday. Yeah, man. They had a larger goal lead at 22 minutes than they did at 37 minutes. <laughs> so I could see how he was getting a little bit stressed. Uh, I would say, though, uh, that they absolutely dominated the first 15 minutes of this game. Oh, without a doubt. And I love where uh, Zyrene was going right off the back end of that cast, kind of going right back to the idea of the wing conditions and, and what we had set out where we were looking to a degree at uh, the draft, for example, yeah. for Optic, but Zyrene making the important distinction that you can draft the best composition in the world. The play still has to be there the invite you know the instances in which you execute and come away with advantage still have to present themselves exactly and i'd identify that i think Opti needs to do tank top carry jungle that's how they got their win that's what they did but with that against a team with the strength of laning that echo fox has you have to get early ganks off and this is where things started to go wrong for optic and right for echo fox absolutely so this is a clear ward that phoenix has put down there they have yeah. vision of they it spotted and the ward being placed they should have they should have and Moments later, Acadian paths right over top of it for his first gank attempt. And 
Optic has great gank assist with Ryze in the mid lane and Maokai on the top side. Yes, Phoenix has cleanse, probably doesn't die there, but you want to start forcing these summoners. That one yeah, doesn't work. Another one. And then after that gank fails, Akkadian goes up to the top side, starts clearing his Krugs, and right away it gets warded out again. Yeah, and that's already the first five minutes of the game. At that point, since Dardoch has tried the failed, or sorry, that Dardoch has seen that Akkadian has tried to gank, Dardoch has an experience advantage on him. It now makes any gank Akkadian does in the future more risky. So. Those are things that really shouldn't be happening. That either means that Acadian uh, isn't paying enough attention to the map or that his laners aren't paying enough attention to where roaming is and are too focused on laning. Because either that should be the mid laner pointing out, hey, he was just spotted in river, it's right. warded, or the other way around. Right. There's a breakdown somewhere hot. there, to exactly. be certain. And after that, obviously, they just start smashing lanes. They have huge CSD. Echo Fox don't really need to force the issues too hard. And then this is, you know, 14 minutes in the game. Finally, after starting to take some terrorists, they get an opening. And Alltech just starts popping off in these fights, gets these first two kills. And it's off the back of a kind of misplayed force that came in from Optic on the top side. Exactly. And I think a lot of teams, the top teams, are going to play Optic in a fairly conservative way in the early game because they're able to generate these large advantages just based off the laning phase. The CSDs across the board, they also had a CSD in the jungle, so a team total of 81 more minion kills at 15 minutes for Echo yeah, Fox, and that nice. was with only two champion kills that we saw at 14 and a half minutes there in the top lane. Like, you could draft as great of a team fighting composition as you want if you're Optic, but if you're down 10,000 gold by the time the first team fight comes around, it don't matter. And I think it's fair to say that like, while this is terrifying versus you know top, top teams like Echo Fox, Team Liquid, uh, TSM will have monster laners. This shouldn't really be a huge concern at other matchups. Like, I don't think you have to be worried about this versus Golden Guardians. Probably not versus FlyQuest. You're not going up against the same difficult laners. Mm -hmm. So they have to find a way to attack these top teams. But it does feel like you can kind of count on Arrow and Power of Evil becoming good late game threats against some of the other matchups. I mean, let's remind ourselves, though, that most recent replay we saw was 14 and a half in. Only two kills given over at this point into the game. Yeah. Here, near the Dragon, the first four for O in favor of Equifax. And this is 17 minutes in. Optic has just finally been able to get a 5v5, but they are already down about 8,000 gold by the time this happens. So the fight just turns into a huge disaster. Phoenix gets a good ultimate off. Callista now already has a Hurricane and a Blade of the Rune King, so they just run over off. This All is right. the nail in the coffin, but it does so take a little while to get the coffin into the ground afterwards. <laughs> there, there it is. The coffin is sealed. The yeah, body's in there. They're not getting we out. We just got to bury it. Yeah. Uh, no, but let me ask yeah. you this then. Who's at fault? How much fault? can or blame can we really lay mm. to Echo Fox or any members on Echo Fox for not having it closed out as cleanly or as quickly as it probably should have been. I think you can definitely look at Phoenix. He is a player who notoriously does some boneheaded moves, sometimes dying to ganks that he should see coming. And in that situation where he kind of started losing the game was his whole team recalled after Baron. He greeds out for mm -hmm. one more wave and gets Ryze TP'd on. And that starts this whole chain of events where it could have just been one death, let's be honest. The rest of Echo Fox didn't need to do that. Yeah. But there are some individual mistakes that Echo Fox needs to clean up because other top teams aren't making them. Yeah, and you can see that there's still that level of talent on Echo Fox where they crush the early game. Uh, this should have been over 15 minutes sooner right. is the thing they're going to try to work on afterwards. Yeah, very much so. Well, Echo Fox picking up the win, bouncing back rather after yesterday's defeat. We're going to step away, but 100 Thieves versus TSM kicks off after the break. Don't go anywhere. Big game. I need arrow a little louder still. Yeah, I need him a little louder. Oh, you guys need my voice. Yeah, I can you, hear you. Like, you have a voice like an angel. A nice pullback as well near the turret. The rest of the team comes in. First blood comes through. No way out. The next one, Dogma. Gonna fall down the double kill for all deck. Oh, no, no, no. Nice, no. nice, nice. Oh, no, no. Get one. Oh, we can still fight. Yeah, we can still go for it. Oh, nice. Nice. Holy oh, shit. Hey, over here, guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm joining, I'm joining, joining, joining. Good! Katie in the wings right here. The damage from the shoot, he doesn't help. Nice! 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 Oh, good defender, shit. Defender, defender! The first kill comes through, the mid laner is gone from Optic, and this will be the fight that wins the game. Two kills already, nothing gonna stop them anymore as that comes forward. A double kill for Hoonian, no one is up to kill anybody anymore. As the ace comes through, clean five for zero, and Echo Fox had to sweat a bit, but they made it come down five to one, and the week in first place. Welcome to Assist of the Week, presented by State Farm. Since we know the importance of lending a hand, we want to highlight players and plays that help the team bring home the big W. 
If you have a favorite assist from this week that you want us to highlight, tweet the clip with the hashtag NALCS and the hashtag State Farm Assist, and we may feature it in a future episode. So get out there and bring some support.